Hey there, Sports History fans. Arnie Chapman here from the Sports History Network to share with you an awesome announcement. Now dig on this. Four of our amazing podcasts have clinched spots in the final round of the Sports Podcast Awards, and we need your support to take home the trophy. First up, we've got Basketball History 101 driving the lane in the best basketball category. Then on deck, we've got Orville Mulligan Sports Writer. He's cracking up the competition in the best sports comedy category. Marty's Illegal Stick is dominating the ice next in the best hockey category. And last but not least, we have Wrestling with Heels on powerbombing its way to victory in the best wrestling category. Now, again, we're counting on you to cast your vote and help out these incredible podcasters secure their well-deserved recognition. It's super easy. All you got to do is head over to the dedicated landing page. That's at sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash vote. Again, that's sports historynetwork.com forward slash vote. Now, let's take another look at sports yesteryear with this episode brought to you by, of course, the Sports History Network. And we'd like to welcome everybody to the Football's Family Podcast. And the time that this will come out, it will be New Year's Eve, which is around the time that the big bowl games are going to be on. And it just so happens to be the perfect time to have this guest on today to talk about one of them. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, sir. My name is Dana Augusta. I am the host of the Historically Speaking Sports podcast right here on the Sports History Network. And I'm very happy and uh, and privileged to be on board with you, sir, and uh, been looking forward to it. Dana Dana and I go uh, way back when this when I started, I think it was just early on for me and for you. I think we got in contact through Twitter. Yeah. And uh, we we got on and, and uh, I'm blessed to know that you are my friend, but I'm also blessed to know that I had a little bit of influence to in getting you on this. And I'm so happy. Oh, yeah, you know. absolutely. I call you the mentor. Oh, well, I appreciate <laughs> that. Uh, if I'm your mentor, though, we're going to go down the wrong road together. Uh, <laughs> no, I do appreciate I do appreciate that, my friend. I you you had and you still do your your podcast has gotten better every time i've listened to it um you have a a way about you you have cadence you have a good voice and and it works out that that people can feel you as a person through your podcast it's not just robotic and i do appreciate that today what i want to do is you messaged me about your grandfather and something about the rose bowl and I just want you to talk because, again, my my podcast here is just about the fan. It's right. just about the history. There's history involved, obviously. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. But I want to know about the fan. So can you talk talk a little bit about what we were talking about? Okay. Well, let me give you a little Cliff Notes version, give you a little backstory. Uh, my grandfather, where I come from, I come from a small town in south Louisiana, New Iberia, Louisiana, which is right on the coast. And my grandfather is a very, very historical figure, I guess you could say, in my neck of the woods, I I should say, because my grandfather was the first African-American principal of a public school after the schools integrated in the late 60s. All right, but let's stop right there. Okay. Um, He's a hero because he probably had to endure a whole lot of stuff. Yeah, he did. He told me stories. Well, you know. that to me, and we don't have to go into detail because it probably is not a good thing to to rehash. But right, the very fact that he did what he did, and how long did he do it? Well, he was principal for that for that one particular school for six years, right before he retired. He retired in the mid mid to late seventies, but he was a school teacher and principal and everything for about thirty years. And that was the crowning achievement of his career is being the first African American principal of a public school. And there's a in the school that they that he was the principal of, they had since changed the name and they had moved it. Actually, it's no it's no longer a school anymore. But the school that replaced it has a shrine dedicated to him. As they and uh, he pretty much helped build the school. As they should. Okay, thank you for sharing that. That's awesome. But go ahead, keep going, keep going. But the but the but he was the real sports fan of my uh, of my of my household. He's the one who gave me the passion for sports. Was him, um, and we talked about the Rose Bowl, and it, 
when it comes down to New Year's Day in the Augusta household, say in the, in the 1980s when I grew up, it was a ritual that took place. And the ritual was simply this. Me and my grandfather would sit around and watch. The first game was always the Cotton Bowl. And we'll sit down there and watch the Cotton Bowl and then followed by the Rose Bowl. And then that was followed by whichever game was the better game because there was always the Sugar Bowl and the Orange Bowl on at the same time. Yeah. So we pretty much had to decide, okay, which bowl game that we're going to watch. Before all of this could happen, though, Jeremy, there was one stipulation that had to be done. And that was that morning, my grandmother had to watch my grandmother and mom had to watch the tournament of roses parade if we did not surrender the television to them to watch the tournament of roses parade there would be we would let's just say we would not be able to watch the games in peace let's just say that my dad wasn't really that my dad's a raiders fan but that's all he's a fan of he's not really a college football fan per se he'll watch it like in self-defense but my grandfather and I were the ones who watched the games religiously, you know, and he was the real sports fan of my household. And that was and that was how he and I bonded every New Year's. Now, I could tell you some stories about, you know, the, the, the main reason why I contacted you to talk about this, because it just because you said something in, in, in another podcast, it just brought me to this. And I'm going to share that with oh, you in a minute. OK, stop. Stop right there, Dana, because in you're talking about in south louisiana it's it's yeah it's closer to texas than it is to pasadena yes so the cotton bowl i get because you're southern you're a southern guy like i am i get the cotton bowl the cotton bowl is respected it's respected mm -hmm. because uh i think it was john eisenberg wrote a book about that i can't remember exactly the cotton bowl days is the name of it and fantastic book um and i might have got his last name wrong and i apologize but he uh, it's a respected game, and Tennessee would go over there often. Texas would play there often. I remember watching that, but why the Rose Bowl? Well, let's just say this. It's the granddaddy of them all. It, to, it was like to, to us and to him mostly, it was the most important game, you know. And, yeah, we grew up in South Louisiana, but there was just something special about the Rose Bowl because New Year's Day in South Louisiana – Typically, it's cold, it's rainy, it's overcast, you, there's nothing much going on outside, but you turn on the Rose Bowl and you see that green, that dark green field that the floor of the Rose Bowl, and you see the palm trees in the background and the bright blue skies, you know, and it, it was just something that was just immediately drawn to that, that, that we were drawn to, uh, especially him. You know, and it was like we had to watch because it was tradition with him. You know, he would he would listen to the Rose Bowl when he said when he was a kid in, in, in high school and in college in the 30s, he would listen to the Rose Bowl on the radio, you know, and he actually and then later on, he told me that he attended one Sugar Bowl in New Orleans and it, it, it was like a tradition with him for the Rose Bowl and all the bowl games because he was a big, big sports fan growing up. You know, it, it, at least for me as a kid watching him and he passed on that that passion for sports. Um, he passed it on to me. You know, he has two he has two sons. One became a high school football coach who recently passed away, unfortunately, my uncle and my dad, who played sports in high school, but he was more interested in other things other than sports like you know woodworking and that sort of thing that floated his boat for 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 me and my grandfather it was really sports so what what did uh <laughs> this year has been kind of weird for me what did i say that brought this up to you well what i was what was going on was that i was listening to um in preparation of you know the in memoriam thing that we do yes. with um with the newman brothers um we, I was listening to something that you said, and you were talking about Vin Scully, and you were talking about, you know, the game, game one, 1988 World Series, and it immediately flashed back to my grandfather, because again, my grandfather was a big sports fan, and the, 
the night that Kirk Gibson hit the home run, I'll never forget. I was Good 15 gracious. years old. Wasn't that an I awesome was 15 day? years old, right? And my grandfather was a diehard Dodgers fan, okay? And if you could imagine my grandpa, first of all, physically, the best way you could describe my grandfather was that if you took a picture of Barack Obama and you gave him black horn rim classic, those black horn rim glasses from like the 60s and a thin mustache, that's my grandpa. And he was a diehard, diehard Dodgers fan. And I remember me and my buddies that went out that night and I came back home and it was, it was all set up. Dennis Eckersley was on the mound and I saw the score and I saw who was on the mound. I said, this is over. It's over. So I'm going to sit here and watch and just watch my grandfather basically curse out the television. <laughs> and he started in preparation because he, they brought up Kirk Gibson to bat. And he followed the Dodgers and he was like, why are they bringing this crippled clown in here to bat? He can't even walk to the plate, much less swing a bat. And I'm sitting there just cracking up, laughing and stuff like that. I had no dog in the fight. I, you know, I mean, I'm just, I'm just watching, right? Next thing you know, Kirk Gibson hits the home run. My grandfather let out the greatest, most blissful scream that you could ever imagine. And he was like jumping up and running around the house and hooping and hollering and stuff like that. Now, got to got to remember, this guy's like in his early 70s when he's doing this, right? And he's jumping around the house like he's 12. And I'm sitting here and on the sofa looking at him and looking at the TV and just total disbelief. But he was just in awe and just in total amazement of what happened. And to him, that was like one of the great, to him, he said that that was like the second greatest sports moment he has ever witnessed. And, I'm dying, and, you did the most, and the greatest one was he attended the very first New Orleans Saints football game. Did he really? And that was the game when John Gilliam returned the opening kickoff for a touchdown in the opening game of the Saints when they played at Tulane Stadium. My grandfather was there. And he said that was the greatest sports moment he had ever witnessed. Now, what is your grandfather's name? Edrin. E-D-R-A-N. Edrin. Edrin. Mr. Edrin. Edrin, Ag Edrin Augusta. Edrin Augusta. Mr. Edrin had several. Obviously, he was into kids and, and their education. He, mm -hmm. he loved you and the family, obviously. But Mr. Edrin also was what we aspire to be one day, just into something to the point where that – makes you happy but my guess is that it didn't devastate him when they lost it wasn't like the end of the world type thing well i'm gonna say this <laughs> i watched a lot of sundays with him watching the saints okay but that that let's just go back and say that that time was not good for the saints that time was not you know <laughs> you know i watched plenty of sundays with him one sunday that comes to mind was my grandfather was on the deacon board of his church, okay? And the one moment, the first time I ever heard my grandfather really curse was the famous Big Ben play between the Falcons and the Saints in the Superdome. Steve Barkowski throws up a Hail Mary at the last second and the Saints and the Falcons catch it off of a deflection and still runs like 20 yards and to get into the end zone to beat the Saints in the Superdome. This was like 1978, 79, somewhere in there. My grandfather rolled off a string of curse words. I didn't think he even knew, but it was like, I was just sitting there like in awe, like my grandfather know those words, you know? I mean, <laughs> <come on. laughs> you, know? Right. you know, and it was, it was, and, and, and that just spoke to really the true sports fan that he was. The only wish that I had was that if he was alive to see the Saints win the Super Bowl. That's the when, and I tell this to people all the time when Tracy Porter makes that interception against Peyton Manning and runs the pick six back, I was screaming like my grandfather. I'm not, you know, I'm not a Saints fan. I'm a Chargers fan. Yeah, yeah. But I was rooting for the Saints because, hey, it's the Saints, you know, and I, I never thought I would actually see this happen in my lifetime. 
But when Tracy Porter was right, I could I just felt like I was channeling my grandfather cheering, you know, because I know he would have been acting a fool. I know he was. All right. So so let me rephrase what I said. He kept things in perspective. How about yes, that? he did. He That's really it. did keep things in perspective. You can enjoy the game, but in life, it's not all about that. Yeah. Yeah, he kept things in perspective. He was very mild mannered. Very, he was one of those people that can that can give you a that could give you a compliment, and it'd be so such of a biting compliment or such of a backhand compliment that you really thought that he was complimenting you when actually he was talking bad about you. And that's just the type of person that he was. He was very no nonsense. The best way to describe his personality is I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Lean on Me with Morgan Freeman playing Principal Joe Clark, but that's some one of Morgan Freeman's early movies when he played the principal of this very tough New Jersey high school. Well, my grandfather was a lot like that. You very in business, no nonsense, straight down the brass tacks. This is who I am. This is what we're doing. And he was just a very straight up, but also very wise, very loving, very care, you know, full of care. And, and he was basically my best friend until I started school because I went with him everywhere. He and I were very, very close, even up to the day he passed. He and I were very, very close. So your your idea of is it New Year's Day? I have not kept up with. I, I do know New Year's Day uh, sometime about two, uh, one or two, I need to be at my parents' house to watch the Alabama game. Yeah, <laughs> it's at uh, five o'clock. It's at five o'clock, and I know. Well, four o'clock here. Five o'clock our time. Four o'clock over there where you are, and that's where you're going to be, right? You're going to have, of course, of course. Have... I got to keep the and, and my son if has started to has, has joined me in the tradition of watching the Rose Bowl. That you I, know. I respect that, uh, Dana. You know my situation. Yes, sir. Um. Don't ever take that for granted, my friend. I know you don't. Oh, of course you. not. I, of course not. I mean, even though my son has gone through some things himself, uh, dealing with autism and dealing with um, ADHD, and he's on the autism spectrum and stuff like that, and he has, and and the thing about it is that I'm he's he's my hero because he played football for one of the best football programs in the state of Georgia and hung out for all four years and was varsity all four years that he was there. And for, and he did all of that dealing with autism and also was a honor student honor was an honor roll made the honor roll never got in trouble and now he's working with the football team as an assistant trainer. If at for a paid internship. Now, if that's not my hero, I don't know what is. I respect that, buddy. That's very respectful. And let him know that the guy that he doesn't know respects the heck out of what he is doing. Please. Oh, me. yeah. Absolutely. And that's what he wants to do. He wants to be a, a, a trainer. He wants to be an athletic trainer. Well, we have a and – I, and I hope he does. I hope he really gets to do that. Um, I told you about the Zoom and about time frame. We're going to get to a point where the Zoom is going to pop up. I do – I do, because what you just told me is exactly what football's family is about. Your grandfather, your son, and you. That's what it is. That's 100%. But I do – I am not as versed in college as I am in pro. I'm just not. I, I, grew, up, I grew up a Vanderbilt Commodore fan, so I wasn't really a football fan, apparently. <laughs> uh, and it wasn't until two of my kids were born in Tuscaloosa that I kind of went that direction. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you were to say, hey, what do you know about college football? It's like, as soon as NCAA football comes back out, I will know more. And they okay. can't hurry up and come out with that. <laughs> Golly. Anyway, what is going on with the Pac-12? Well, what, I, I just kind of wish that the powers that be, they set up the, the playoff system, would have had Washington playing the Rose Bowl one last time because the Pac-12 has always been connected with the Rose Bowl for – even back before it was even the pack eight, you know, it was like back when it was the, I think it was the athletic association of the Pacific schools or something like that. Some long drawn out word soup of a name. And, but the pack 12, I've always been a fan of, you know, I'm a UCLA fan. 
but I have mad respect for USC. I have mad, the only school I really don't care for in college football that I really have a somewhat of a semi-hatred for is Notre Dame. Okay. <laughs> and I just, for some, I just don't like Notre Dame and just never did, but UCLA, USC, Oregon, Oregon State, all those Pac-12 schools. And unfortunately, it's the demise of the Pac-12, which is sad for me because, again, my grandfather and I, I was introduced to college football watching USC versus UCLA. I was introduced to that. You know, LSU at the time was not good. You know what I mean? Talking about mid-80s. LSU had some okay teams and they would make a bowl game here and there, but they wasn't like what LSU is now. They just weren't. Um, but when it came down to the USC was good. UCLA was good. When I started watching them and following them, when they had Rick Neuheisel as, as, as the quarterback, not the coach, but Rick Neuheisel was a quarterback there. That's when I started following them. And plus they got the coolest colors in college football. Let's just be honest. Best uniforms in college football. Okay, this is coming from a Chargers fan, folks. So yes, of course. That, that, Powder blue very, and gold, baby. It's very, That's it it's very similar. <laughs> And I don't know if I told you this or not, but powder blue and gold is also my wedding colors. Oh, golly. You're going to have to show me pictures, dude. You're going to have to show <laughs> We're me also pictures. my wedding colors. You you send me a picture as soon as you can. I got to see this. <laughs> I got to see this. because I, I, I was wearing a white tux and all my all my grooms were wearing gray with blue ties, you know, and the, and the bridesmaids were wearing gold, you know. <laughs> oh, gosh. I love it. I love it. Yeah, I'm gonna say I'm gonna have to find a picture and send it to you. But I'm gonna also send you a picture of my grandpa too. Yeah, please do, please do. Um, so I have a problem. I'm I'm a traditionalist like you are. Uh-huh. Maybe not the same level because again, I'm telling you, I'm not a college guy. I I've, I've studied a lot on the um. I believe one of the first big games that Alabama had was in the Rose Bowl. Mm-hmm. And I yeah, 1924. I want to say they played Washington. Yes, yes, they did. And it was uh, broadcast in, back in Tuscaloosa, and it took a long time to get back there. It really did. Yes. They they rode on a uh, a, a train for several days to get there. Um, I watch – I remember some years, Dana, that I would – that the four TV – the two TV channel, uh, ABC, NBC, CBS. Right. They all had games going on at one time, and I remember going back yeah. and forth. Now I don't have regular TV, so I have to go to another city to get – to, to watch mm-hmm. something. I, I remember and what you're saying, you have to pick, sometimes you just have to pick a game. But I remember the Rose Bowl is always the Big Ten and the Pac-12. Yep. Always that. But one year, and I might be off on this, so you need to correct me because I know you'll know it. It was the BCS title game against yep. USC in Texas. USC and Texas. That was 06. It was 06 because I know you know where I'm going with this being a Titans fan. You know where I'm going with this. Vince Young. Vince Young, yes, sir. I went to sleep. I slept through that last drive. Really? Yeah, that just tells you I, I'm old. I'm just, that's how it is. And <laughs> I woke up, I kid you not, Dana, I woke up the next day and I saw video of Texas winning. I'm like, what in the world? Of course, the internet wasn't that big. It was mm-hmm. dial up. But within a couple of days, they replayed the game. So I watched it. And I was like, Dad, gone. Vince, Vince Young doing what he did at the right moment got him drafted. Right. And Matt Liner really took his career down. Reggie Bush was just insane, period. Yeah. But it was always, you know, like Michigan or Ohio State going yes. to Pasadena, and it was viewed as a very important game. Do you think it has diminished because of the the uh, the, the playoffs? I mean, it's, 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 it's funny that you ask that because I was talking with somebody about this very similar thing a couple of days ago that I don't think that the playoffs have diminished it. I just think that what you had back then, everything is subject to, ch- subject to change eventually. Um, I think that with the way that college football is now with the, with the not expanding to 12 teams instead of the four, there was so much more drama in college football back then because of who would be voted national champ, not who was going to be, who was going to win one versus two or who was going to win the national championship game. Back then, 
doing my time and my doing the years that I watched it when I was a kid, it was always who would be voted number one. We rarely, rarely had a one versus two matchup in a bowl game. And I think that there was some built-in drama behind that back then. Um, now the drama is okay. Who, which team? Which four teams is going to be in the Final Four for the BCS or whatever it is? And you, and there was a lot of excitement just in that. You know, the bowl games are still going to be the bowl games, but I think that it has to finish because of the prestige of it and the importance of it because the Rose Bowl was Pac-10 versus Big 12. I mean, a Pac-10 versus Big 10. Orange Bowl was Big 8 against an at large. The Cotton Bowl was the Southwest Conference against another at large or most likely Notre Dame. Sugar Bowl was SEC versus ACC or something like that or or Big 10 or something like that, but the, but an SEC team was always in the Sugar Bowl, a Big 12 or Big 8 team was always in the Orange Bowl and the Southwest Conference which was all of the Texas schools plus Arkansas was in the Cotton Bowl. And that's the way it was back then and I think that it kind of diminished because there is not that quote unquote what they call the mythical national champion. They don't have that anymore. So that, I think that was a little bit of, you know, a little bit of drama in those games, you know, and there's no drama now. And of course, when you had that drama t- take uh, take place after the game, you know, because right now working on one of the things right now is like this year, in fact, on the second, it's the 40th anniversary of the Orange Bowl between Miami and Nebraska, the famous should he go for two championship game when Tom Osborne went for two to, to, to win it instead of selling on a tie, which he would have been awarded a national championship, even though he had, to, even though he would have tied Miami, you know, that was 40 years ago. That awesome game with Bernie Kosar and Benny Blades or Brian Blades and Alonzo Highsmith with, for Miami. Turner Gill was a quarterback for Nebraska. And, and, you know, I'm, I could go on and on about that game because that was like one of the first college football games I remember watching where it was like, this was a really, really good game, you know, and I was like, what, 11 years old watching that game. I, I see, I, I absolutely love that because I don't remember, I remember uh, Bernie Kosar as a Brown, but I don't remember the lead up. So I've watched a lot of stuff with him leading up to it. That That's amazing. What, uh, and like I said, it's getting to a point where I'm going to, I'm going to cut it off here, but I want to keep talking as long as we can. Right. Um, I don't know if I like the super conferences, Dana. I don't know if I like that. I'm, I'm, it's like they got to they gotta do something. And I think that UCLA's coach Chip Kelly had a brilliant idea. I'm not sure it would do that because, of course, there's money involved. Money is the great equalizer. But one of the things that Chip Kelly th- think he would they should do is make – Two super conferences, like kind of like have it the way that is done in premier foot, you know, premier soccer in England, where you have a top tier, which would be like all of the big time money making schools and set that up like an AFC NFC type thing where you have a once one conference, like you have like the Western schools and you all play like say, say, for example, UCLA, UCLA would play all the Western schools. Okay, and every now and then you throw in like five games, like four games against teams in the East, you know, and just do this just strictly for football. Basketball, baseball, softball, all the other sports will go back to the regular Pac-12, Big Ten, you know, the, the, the way it is now. Okay, and football would be just totally separate. Okay, and just do that. And then like smaller schools, like for example, Tulane and Louisiana Tech and, you know, maybe Vanderbilt or something like that, you know, the smaller schools that doesn't make as much money, but are still considered major schools, they play for their own national title. And the two teams that had like two or three teams that had great records from that lower division go up to that top tier. And schools that were struggling in this top team go, you know, that top tier go down to the other tier with the smaller schools and do that like every two years or so, just switch them up, you know, depending upon record. And I thought that was a pretty interesting idea. But the super conferences, for me, I'm just waiting to see 
how they des- how they how they fix this. I'm not gonna pass judgment yet. Just let me see how how it all looks. I was I saw somewhere today that for Florida State to leave, and I might be wrong on this, but I I saw it on the internet, so it has to be 100 right if it's on the internet. <laughs> that it cost them 120 million dollars to leave the ACC. Yes, exactly. they have some kind of an agreement. I forgot the name of it offhand. But it was an agreement that they signed when they joined the ACC, I think like 12 or so years ago. And they have to stay part of the ACC to like the 2030s, you know. But the reason why they want to leave is because they're not making their top tier school, but they're lynched to the ACC. And the ACC is not as prestigious in football as they are in basketball. ACC is a basketball conference. Far and wide, you know, the last time in eight, well, you had Clemson and then that's it. Basically, they, they, they put all their eggs in football. You know, Miami has gone down. Yeah. Florida State is is really good, but they just was unlucky, especially today. Uh, well, did, they, did they lose today? By, by Georgia. Oh, well, that's Georgia. Georgia had a, I hate to say this, a, a bone to pick with everybody. That's all. And I thought, and I really thought there was going to be somewhat the opposite because I thought that Florida State was going to come in there inspired because they want us to show everybody they re- indeed deserve to be in the Final Four. And the way it turned out, not so fast. <laughs> um, I and I'll tell you this: coming from an Alabama fan, I'm looking up the game right now. Um, Florida State deserved to be in there. The only the only thing that would be different. Good gracious. <laughs> 63 to 3. Yeah. Holy cow. I stopped watching it at halftime, to be honest. What? Oh, they put it 35 points by in the second quarter. Good gracious. What did Florida State think? Uh the only reason I believe they didn't make it to the to the playoffs was because of the ACC SEC thing. Yes. And you know, they wanted to list the thing where you know, they they lost their starting quarterback and one of the worst injuries I've seen on this side of Joe Theismann. It was bad. It was a gruesome injury for that, that young man to suffer. And it, he was a senior also to boot. So that was tragic. That was that was very unfortunate. But I think that with Florida State in their situation, you know, I really do believe that. I don't think that they were good enough because they played the ACC and the ACC schools aren't up to snuff as say the Pac-12, which really showed out this year. They really did um, in their in their swan song, so to speak. Well, Texas went to Tuscaloosa and beat Alabama. That was impressive. Michigan is Michigan. And I'm rooting for Michigan because I'm hoping beyond hope that Harbaugh leaves and become the Chargers' new head coach. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 yes. I am. Yes, yes. And the truth, Guilty the truth as charged. That's what I'm. That's what I'm rooting for. The truth comes out at football's family. Uh, here's here's the problem I find with this is it was 100 percent politics. Texas deserves to be in it, but yeah. guess what? Texas is going to be next year. SEC. SEC. Alabama won the SEC against a team that hadn't lost in three years. Yes. And we see today just how good they are. Right. Does that mean that they deserve to jump everybody, even Georgia? Does that mean they deserve to jump a Georgia or a Florida to move into the number four position? Michigan, to me, is a clear number one. Yeah. And Washington, to me, I, were they third or second? Washington, second. They're going to play Alabama. I'm sorry, Washington. It's not going to be good for you. No, no. Pac-12, Pac-12, as much as I love the Pac-12, Pac-12 schools do not have – they got the speed. Pac-12 is known for speed, but they just don't have the strength. Alabama's – here it goes, another one of those phrases. I'm so sorry about this. Alabama's going to roll. Sorry, I said that out loud. I think Michigan's going to win it all, despite my, despite my obvious – uh, object, you know, just by my obvious, put you rooting, you know. But I think that I think Michigan is due. I think oh, as I, a school, Michigan is due. I I think if if I were to put it on any other team, of course I'm not a college guy, but I believe Michigan will probably win the whole thing because their team. I did watch several of their games against Ohio State. Even 
their team has just rounded out. Alabama has looked rough this year in yeah. certain situations. That Auburn game was not as close as the score indicated. I think Auburn played better. They just yeah. that last play. Auburn should have won, probably in my opinion. Auburn should have won. Uh, Texas is definitely a better team than than Alabama. And Washington, I don't know. It's like if you're uh, comparing apples to oranges, I, I don't know. Washington had a great season, but are they SEC or Texas or Big Ten level? I don't know. Hmm. Yeah. But we shall see. That's no, let me, We let, shall see in the next couple of days. Let me uh, close this up here, my friend. Uh, and like I said, this, this episode will be aired on the 31st, which is just four hours away. It will be aired pretty early in the morning. And it kind of gives you a, a kind of indication about how great Dana is about his family and about what he likes. Who's playing in the Rose Bowl this year? This Ro- the Rose Bowl is the Alabama, uh, Texas. Is it Alabama? Is Alabama and Mich- is is it Michigan? Yeah, Michigan. Alabama, Michigan, and Washington plays Texas in the Sugar. So it's Alabama, Michigan in the Rose Bowl. Alabama, Michigan in your Rose Bowl and. I should know that I've been seeing it. I've been seeing advertisements for us all day long. <laughs> and I know where you're going to be. So when you sit down to watch it, uh, just message me. Uh, I'm going to message you on Slack in a little bit, give you my phone number. Okay. We'll go back and forth, my friend. All right. If you, if you see a weird number pop up from the area code of Middle Tennessee, it's just me. It's just a weird person. It's not a weird number. It's a weird person. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, you and I in the same boat. You know that. Well, I know that. Hey, we're we're very similar. We're very similar. We probably have very similar haircuts too. If we, yeah, yeah, we yeah, we do, we do. Uh, that comes from having kids, folks. That comes yes, from having kids. yes, yes, yes. I am proud to call you my friend and my brother. You are a good man, and I enjoy talking with you. And uh, everybody, listen to his podcast. Uh, do you you want to throw it out your podcast and your Twitter handle and everything? Once upon, uh, once again, my podcast is Historically Speaking Sports. My Twitter handle is Historically SP2, whether it's Twitter or X, it's the same thing. I don't know what you even call it It's, it's Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but yeah, Historically Speaking Sports, I have an episode that's coming out like next week sometime uh, talking about the 1984 Orange Bowl between Nebraska and Miami, also the historic losing streak of the Detroit Pistons, which believe it or not, ended tonight. They beat Toronto. Oh, so it ended at 28 consecutive losses. Um, we got talking about that. I'm also going to talk about the senior inductees to the uh, Pro Football Hall of Fame that's coming up. So, so we got is jam-packed this upcoming um, episode that's coming out this upcoming week. And I enjoy every moment of it. Thank you, Dana. Like I said, I'm about to have to get out before it kicks me out. Yeah. Thank you. Happy New Year, my friend. And Happy New Year to you and your family, man. And much love to you. And thanks for the kind words. Oh, anytime. And guys who are listening, my my, my uh, audience here, our audience, thank you. And have a great New Year's. And we'll see you back in 2024. Right on. Hey there, Sports History fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude. And I wanted to thank you for stopping by to listen to another episode here on the Sports History Network. Our podcasters are passionate about uncovering and sharing sports stories from yesteryear. And if you didn't know it already, we have over 30 shows across the network covering all sorts of sports history topics. In fact, here's a glimpse into one of our awesome podcasts here on the network. The Pigskin Tales podcast is all about the lesser known pro football players. Yes, there are stories about the ones we know, like Brad Tarkenton and Harold Red Grange. But have you ever heard of Ernie Nevers? How about Dave Osborne or even Grady Alderman? These men created their own path to the NFL. How did they do it? Listen to the Pigskin Tales podcast. Now streaming on your favorite music platform. Go to pigskintails.com. How about that? I bet you're super hyped to go listen to that new podcast, right? Well, to learn about this show and all the other podcasts on the network, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Again, that's sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Head over there today to find your next favorite sports history podcast.